Hello, folks. Welcome to Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. This week, I've got another special guest, much like my last guest, Josh. I met Roger Bat about, I'm going to say, five, six weeks ago. He gave me a little bit of a story. I didn't have a chance. We didn't have a chance to discuss it much. But the minute I had the idea for the show, I thought, you know, I need to reach out to Roger. So here he is. How are you, Roger? Hi, Eddie. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here with you today. My pleasure. And thanks for agreeing to this. I know it's kind of an odd time of the day to make this accommodation, but I appreciate it. That's okay. <laughs> so uh, my, my name is Roger Batt. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Idahoan. My uh, family uh, started farming here in 1915. Uh, they put in the first hop yards in 1934. Um, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Navy, served four years in the uh, early to mid-90s. I've owned and operated a business called Bad Associates the last 20 years. And what we do is we manage organizations and do lobbying work for uh, our agricultural natural resource organizations and companies. And so this time of year, we're really busy at the Idaho Legislature. So it's an honor to be able to uh, be on this program today and take some time away from that, too. So, Eddie, thank you very much for the invitation for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, my conversion story is really nothing short of the Holy Spirit's divine work. I, I started thinking about this a lot. Uh, nothing short of that. Uh, God, for whatever reason, wanted me to be part of his family and in, in, in his holy church. And so it's an honor, it's an honor to finally be there. Uh, it includes a lot of different events that took place over about a one-year period in, in 2015. Uh, most of it took place during that time, but there's also a lot of people involved as well that the Spirit uh, also led towards us too. Um, some of these events that took place were there was a huge flare-up in the church that my wife Gail and I were going to. Uh, we were really highly involved in that church at the time. Uh, there were two Holy Catholic priests involved, which I'll talk about. Uh, some wonderful Christian friends uh, who just are just outstanding people and, and uh, we just love them so much. There was a concussion, unfortunately, involved in this too, which actually helped for the better. And then the uh, Catholic radio station and a Catholic men's conference. So there's kind of those series of events that took place. So to, to start off, you know, I wasn't looking for conversion. Uh, my wife and I were both third generation Missouri Senate Lutherans. And Missouri Senate Lutherans uh, are the more conservative side of the Lutheran church. There's a there's a Evangelical Lutheran, there's Missouri Senate Lutheran, and there's Wisconsin Senate. So Missouri Senate, is, we, it was considered more conservative, and it had, a, had its own branch or division or synod that they would call, based out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we uh, were born and raised in that church, confirmed in that church, uh, married in that church, uh, you know, a, a long time ago. And, uh, and I was an elder in that church as well. I served seven years as an elder, uh, three years as the chairman of the board of elders. So elders, we used to serve communion. Uh, we used to, uh, you know, take lists of people in the congregation and kind of mentor them through difficult things with the pastor. Uh, when the pastor was gone, uh, he would ask me to oftentimes do the sermons or uh, to take his place and do the liturgy. Uh, we would sometimes take turns doing that. So we were really involved. Um, and, and so what happened was there was a huge flare up in that church. The pastor that had been there 18 years uh, decided to retire. He was a wonderful man. Uh, I, I wish him the very best uh, in, in what he's doing even now in retirement. But uh, there was an interim pastor who had stepped in who wanted to make a few changes that some of the congregation at that time didn't like. And, and what we didn't know as elders had been happening was the church had not been following their own doctrine. They were allowing uh, folks who were not... Uh, uh, confirmed uh, to take Holy Communion. And so that didn't sit well with us as elders. And so we agreed with the interim pastor to go ahead and let those uh, changes be made. Well, that created a lot of friction with uh, a certain group. There's about 20 or so within the church. And as you can imagine, uh, it, it, be, it became church politics at its very worst, really, is what, what happened. So um, terrible things were said about us as elders, uh, individually, uh, uh, also personally, um, and scathing notes were sent to us, uh, you know, where we, of course, we forgave everybody and, you know, tried to get through it all. Uh, but even a meeting with the district pastor, whoever saw the other pastors in the area, had to come in and try to mitigate some of this. And it, unfortunately, never did get resolved that way. So 
Um, after about six months of dealing with it, a lot of us stepped down from the board who had served for a, a lot of years. Uh, some, and, and then some of us, including myself and my wife, even left the congregation at that time. So uh, after 12 years uh, being in that church and, and ser serving like we did, uh, and, and even some non-elders left too. So it wasn't just the elders. Um, needless to say, I was heartbroken and devastated during that time because I, I had finally found uh, a church that I really loved, finally found some people in a congregation that I really loved and respected. And uh, and it was gone. So, so my wife and I went to the uh, church that my wife's mother originally taught me Sunday school when I was five or six years old here in Homedale. And uh, we had gone uh, to that church before, but weren't members of it. We were members of a larger church before that. So we went back to the smaller congregation where there's family and members of the community who we've known for a long time. And uh, I was just not being spiritually fed. Um, I had plenty of family around me. Uh, we could talk about different things, but uh, they didn't quite understand what I was feeling, of course, and I was just not spiritually fed. So I started to drift away a little bit uh, from the faith itself, uh, from, from reading the Bible, from going to church. And uh, I, I was kind of a mess during that time. Um, I, I, uh, I, I just recall being very spiritually hungry, you know, for, 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 for something to happen. And sure. I prayed a lot. I kept asking God, you know, will you please put something into my life here that, that will help? And so um, in the meantime, Gail and I had been attending Mass in Jordan Valley just, just at different periods of time. My, uh, my niece and nephews grew up there. Uh, they make the seventh generation on the ranch up there. My wife's sister's married one of the ranchers. And uh, they're just, I just want to say the people up in Jordan Valley in that area are just salt of the earth people. They are just amazing uh, people. And we've built some really deep friendships. And of course, we watched our niece and nephews play sports. So any high school sports uh, that they would play, football, volleyball, basketball, we would be at those games on Saturday nights, sometimes Friday and Saturday night. Uh, and then sometimes we would spend the night and then we'd end up going to mass in the morning uh, with Gail's sister and the family just, just uh, to attend church. And so um, we would uh, join them uh, and we would also sometimes uh, go up there to attend mass at the same time we would be still be going to church here in Homedale. Now the priest at that time uh, in Jordan Valley, his name is Father Clemens. He's not there anymore, he's, he's over in Burns, Oregon. Uh, but he was the priest during that time. And I'll tell you what, Father Clemens was holy, and he was holy like I have never seen a church leader be holy ever before in my entire life. Um, his reverence and zeal for God's church, it was like none other I'd ever witnessed in my entire life. And he, his homilies were just so amazing. They, they really spoke to me into my heart. And he was not afraid to speak the truth either. If it was against abortion or, or you know, the things that are against the church, he wasn't afraid to speak out against those things and, and the evil that's out there too. And, you know, love just emanated from this holy priest. He was, uh, it, it was evident in, in, in everything that he did, uh, that love just poured forth from him. And so I was really attracted to that. I was attracted to what he was saying, what I was hearing. Uh, and, and, and I kept thinking, how much, you know, where does this love come from? You know, what, what, what's, what, what makes him so much different than, than, uh, than the rest of us and other church leaders that I've been involved in? So, Gail and I, we were, we were really fortunate enough to get to know Father Clemens through Tracy, uh, Gail's sister, because she would invite Father to dinners and uh, events and sporting events and things afterwards up to the ranch. And the ranch is about nine miles out of town, so it's a little bit of a drive to get out there. Uh, but once you're out there, you know, you're together and you have a lot of time to, to talk and communicate with one another. So we became really good friends with, with Father Clemens, and, and uh, we were very fortunate to get to know him. So... Um, you know, the few months that passed uh, between that time and, and uh, what I'll get into here pretty quick, we, we still continued to go to the Lutheran Church here in Homedale, uh, occasionally to Mass in Jordan Valley, we would still do that. Um, you know, and it's funny because one day after Mass, uh, Father Clemens, you know, saw us, and it, it had been a little while, uh, we started talking a little bit, and he, he, he just looked at Gail and I, and he says, you're going to become Catholic. We kind of looked at him like, what, you know, we're, we're going to become Catholic. And the reason why we kind of reacted that way is like, we thought to ourselves, why would we become Catholic? Because we as Lutherans, you know, actually, quote unquote, fix the Catholic church. You know, that, that's what we thought. So anyway, so why would we ever become Catholic? So anyway, so we, but we kind of mold on that for a little bit and, and, and thought about that. And that'll kind of come back to light here 
uh, later in the presentation. Let, but let me let me jump in for one second there. Absolutely, so you bet. The difference between Missouri Synod and the Catholic Church, if you were just a newcomer, let's say you're an atheist and you just walked into those two different churches, would you see a dramatic difference, or would you just see a slight variance? I mean, I know the answer, but how would you describe it to a newcomer that's walking into those two churches? You see a slight variance, really, and the reason why I say that is because the liturgy is pretty pretty similar. Uh, it, you know, the the liturgical stuff is similar. Uh, the way the service is done, it's similar. Um, you know, uh, the Nicene Creed is very similar. It's almost verbatim similar. The Apostles' Creed is identical. Um, you know, Holy Communion uh, seems similar to a newcomer until you really understand. You know, two churches really related. So. I would say there's a lot of similarities. It really wasn't, uh, you know, converting from Catholic or fr from Lutheran to Catholicism, uh, in that sense, really wasn't difficult at all. Liturgically, it was great. It was like, oh, this is pretty easy. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, over the months uh, after Father Clement said you're going to become Catholic, we would still attend Mass in Jordan Valley once in a while. We would still attend the Lutheran Church, but I started uh, hearing things preached from both churches that I started kind of putting together in my own in my own mind that I hadn't heard before and I'm not saying this to badmouth the Lutheran church by any means um, you know I still have great respect for it and it really brought me to a point to where I wanted to deepen my faith and go further with it through the Catholic church but um, I but what I was hearing uh, at the Lutheran church that I was attending during that time was I was hearing I was hearing salvation preached of course uh, they, they didn't short that, but I was hearing it preached through faith alone and, and through no other means. And I was also hearing, this is what, you know, God can do for you. So I was hearing faith alone, and this is what God can do for you. And then the Catholic Church, I was hearing salvation preached, of course, uh, not only through faith, but uh, they, they would add also through demonstrating uh, your faith through the works that you have to show your faith, which I'd never really thought of before. I've, obviously, I'd read the book of James before where he talks about faith and works and you know you, you can tell me your faith but i'll show you my faith through my works well that made sense to me that clicked with me but what i was also hearing in the catholic church preached is this is what you can do for god and also for your neighbor and i didn't hear that in the lutheran church at all it was more like what god can do for me what you know what, what can i get the most out of god instead of you know what can i do for god what can god get the most out of me and how can I love my neighbor and deepen my faith? And I was hearing Father Clements kind of give us some, some take home, uh, like some homework type assignments too. You know, okay, this week I want you to go and I want you to find out how you're going to deepen your faith. And then I want you to increase your love for your neighbor, you know, through charity and, and uh, you know, figure out how you're going to do that. So and those were great assignments because those really kind of helped me dig into, to, you know, wow, this is what God really wants for me. And this is what I've been lacking all of this time too. So, um, I was also having conversations with a great Catholic friend of mine. His name is Aaron Phillips, and he's at Idaho Falls. He and his family, they moved to Idaho from Texas, and he worked for Del Monte at that time. Uh, and uh, I was sharing with him, you know, just in a conversation about what I was hearing, the difference between the two churches as I, as I was hearing it being preached from the pulpit and the ambo. And it was funny because not long after that, uh, I get this this book in the mail from him uh, called The Four Witnesses by author Rod Bennett. And uh, I read a few of the pages. And, and if anybody hasn't read The Four Witnesses that's watching this, I would really encourage you to do that because it's an outstanding book. It's about uh, four men, uh, some of them who actually knew Jesus' disciples, uh, who actually give real accounts of the early church. And it, uh, it, it, the, the historical period is from about 35 to 202 AD uh, that these four men who are actually saints now uh, give as far as their testimony. And so, you know, part of the way through reading, uh, maybe into five or six pages of the second uh, chapter or whatnot of the book, it, it just hit me like a hammer. It really did. It, uh, I recognized at that time that the church that the Lord Jesus Christ had established and given the, the keys to Peter, um, you know, even though some people broke away from that church through the Reformation, that it actually remains very much alive today. And, you know, after 2,000 years, we have this unbroken lineage with still the same authority and power that Christ gave it, you know, himself to this holy church. And, you know, I had never thought about this before ever. 
I, I mean, that never even dawned on me to even think that way, nor did I ever think about the early church either. I never really dove into the early church and the history and, and uh, you know, what it went through versus where we are now. Um, never even thought about those things, you know. Uh, so it was a great read, and it really it really deepened my faith. It really did. And, and I, I want to thank my friend Aaron for, for, for doing that for me. And, and in the Lutheran church, you have, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember this correctly, called Calendar of Saints, right? Sainthood is not foreign to Lutherans. It no, may, it's not. Yeah, it may no. be foreign to modern movements, but if you go back yes. in time and you get closer to the time of the Reformation, sainthood, they recognize a lot of if I'm not mistaken, they they recognize some early church figures, not just the gospel, they but they recognize others. Right. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct, Eddie. They do in it, but it's still even even you know growing up in that church, I I, I never did uh, look into all of that. I never did understand. Well, you know, go to understand, you know, why we had saints or uh, you know anything about the early church, and even the churches we attended growing up, we didn't uh, have you know any kind of uh, a saints day or anything like that that we even celebrated. So while we knew about them, um, we didn't really know much about them. At least I didn't anyway. So yeah. uh, you know. Uh, uh, I, I'm thankful that I, I say I say the book, The Four Witnesses, hit me over the head with a hammer, basically. Fortunate, fortunately enough, that didn't happen literally. And so <laughs> um, my wife, on the other hand, poor Gail, she suffered a concussion. Uh, it was in October of that same year, moving cows with her sister. Uh, her sister prodded the cow. The cow kicked the gate. The gate slammed her in the forehead. Uh -huh. And I was actually coming back from a steelhead fishing trip during that time, and I got the phone call. And uh, I, saw the, I saw the knot on my wife's forehead, later saw the black eye two weeks later uh, that, that, was on, that was on her left eye. And uh, everywhere we would go, people would kind of look at me funny because they're like, you know, they'd see my wife's black eye, and they'd look at me and you know, kind of, what'd you do, you know? But <laughs> anyway, we kind of joke about that now. But um, really what came later from Gail's concussion was, was much worse. It, uh, she suffered post-concussion syndrome. Uh, any kind of white irritated her, like really bad. Um, she had night terrors. Uh, silence was deafening to her. So sil silence, uh, you know, to most people is silence, but to her it was deafening. So the only thing that would alleviate that was listening to the radio. So um, for whatever reason uh, that my wife still does not know about today, this is a very unknown thing to her. She ended up tuning into Salt and Light Radio here in Boise and uh, not even knowing what it was. And the only thing that was soothing to her was listening to the mass uh, while she was driving to a doctor's appointment for post-concussion. Um, so she was immediately comforted by listening to the mass off Salt and Light Radio. And so she would continue to do this day after day after day just to, to soothe you know, her mind and, and, uh, and, and take, that, take that silence away. Well, one day after listening to mass on Salt and Light Radio, uh, she heard a second holy priest in my conversion story, and that's Father Larry Richards. And Father Larry uh, gave this homily, and she, uh, I remember coming home from, from work one day, and she goes, you got to listen to this guy. She goes, he's, he's unreal. I mean, he's just amazing. And so I, I, I listened to him, and I was totally blown away by, by what he said, and uh, not, just, not just by what he said, but his knowledge of, of Scripture uh, and how we could apply it to our daily lives, and, uh, you know, again, what we can do for God, what we can do for our neighbor, how to increase our faith and love. Um, those were things I just kept hearing over and over again. So I was really fascinated about Father Larry's knowledge of the Bible and how he could convey it to, to people like myself, you know, who didn't quite understand a lot of things. Um, so anyway, uh, so we got to religiously listen to Father Larry's homilies on his website, and, and we couldn't wait for the next one to come out. I mean, it was just like, okay, when's he going to do this? Because we, we, we'd still go to church, you know, in Homedale, but after the homily was done, we'd come home and say, man, we got to listen to this guy, you know. So one day, Gail was listening to Salt and Light Radio and found out that Father Larry was coming to the Catholic Men's Conference uh, in 2016. It was the very first one that they ever put on. And so um, coming home from work, she says, you know, I really think you ought to go to that and, and watch Father Larry. And I thought about it for a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, it's during the legislature, you know, don't want to take a Saturday, do all this, uh, had all these excuses, finally ended up signing up and, and, I, and I went. So 
Um, the first one was held at Boise State University in the Student Union Building, which it was upstairs and it's this big, uh, big area where there, were, what I was told, there were at least a thousand men there, which, which was phenomenal. I mean, I, I don't think they expect that good of a turnout for that. Um, it was energizing to be around that many men um, and, and, and to be at a, at, a, at a conference where they're, you know, talking about God and talking about salvation and talking about Jesus and all kinds of other things. And, you know, the things that I kind of uh, were involved in growing up were smaller than that. They were like groups of 50 or whatnot, but nothing this this size. It was it was incredible. Um, and I think I was probably very, very likely the only non-Catholic at that time to attend. And the reason why I say that is because when Bishop Peter Christensen had mass, um, everybody went up for Holy Communion. I, I stayed in my seat because I knew it was wrong to do that. So um, I just remember looking around the room and, and looking at everybody and everybody's standing up and I'm not. So <laughs> anyway, so it, it was a little uncomfortable, but you know, but nothing, nothing bad. So, um, and I remember listening to Peter, uh, Bishop Peter Christensen the first time I was totally blown away. Uh, I thought, wow, this guy's amazing, you know, and he's the leader of the Catholic Church here in Idaho. I, I, I just, I was completely fascinated by what he said too. Um, you know, the rest of the presentations that day were excellent. Uh, there were some great accounts of, um, you know, people performing exorcisms and, 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 and doing things, you know, that I've, I, I'd always heard about, you know, being done, uh, knowing that, of course, you know, spiritual warfare is real, and uh, heard, uh, heard uh, Guy Gruders talk about his faith as he was a POW, you know, back in, in Vietnam and the war, um, and then, you know, the spirit just kept pulling at my heart all day long, but I didn't know really what uh, I was supposed to do or listen for. I just, I, I just remember I kept praying all day long, you know, Lord, you know, I'm still at this point. It had been several months that I've been praying for, you know, God to please help us, give us some spiritual and where he wants us. And so um, it was uh, the last item on the agenda was adoration. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, didn't know what it was. Uh, I, I almost left to go home instead of staying there for it. Thankfully, I didn't. <laughs> but uh, there was a short explanation about what it was. I still didn't quite understand it, but I, I understood that it had to do with worshiping Jesus through the Eucharist. Um, we called it, uh, we didn't call it the Eucharist, we just called it Holy Communion in the Lutheran Church, so the Eucharist was a, a different term for us. Sure. Um, and I also understood that the Catholic uh, Church believed that Jesus is physically present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Sacrament, in the simple form of bread and wine. So, uh, so I could accept that. I, I was like, okay, you know, I, 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 I kind of get that. So, because in the Lutheran Church, you know, we had Holy Communion, we had the, the body, what, what we call the body and blood. Um, we didn't believe it was trans, uh, you know, transubstantiated like the Catholic Church does, but uh, but we did uh, be believe that uh, that it represented the body and blood. So, so I kind of knew a little bit about that. So I remember Father Larry comes back in and he actually leads us in adoration. He had spoken uh, a couple times, I believe, that day, a couple couple different times, and he walked us through uh, adoration. You know, if you'd never done this before, you go ahead and just you know. And he had he had us all kneel. Ever and I, I really what uh, I shouldn't say surprised me, but I was impressed at was the reverence everybody had for the Eucharist. You know, I'd look around the room and everybody was just silent, and some people were you know uh, basically uh, just laying uh, prone, you know, on 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 uh, flat on the ground, and others were others were kneeling. So. So kneeling, I, I, I never, I'll never forget Father Larry said these words, and I'm just going to read these. I said, Father Larry said, I want you to close your eyes and picture Jesus walking towards you with his arms open to you. Tell him that you are sorry and that you love him and desire to be loved by him. Words I really hadn't heard before, but, you know, I, it started to hit me pretty good. And, and so I started to say those words mentally. Uh, and, and in the meantime, I could feel, I could feel heat like heat coming from where the Eucharist was, where, where the monstrous was. I didn't know what it was called. Sure. And I thought, wow, that's, that's weird. I've never felt that before. You know, it, it just, it, 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 was, it was strange to me, but it was about that minute, Eddie, when uh, I, I mentally said those things that Father Larry told us to say. And then this overwhelming peace came over me um, that I, I could not explain at the time. Uh, and, and it was a peace that I've never experienced anywhere in my entire life up to that point. And it was real. It was very real. Uh, it hit me like a spiritual hammer. And uh, 
it was beautiful and I, and I didn't want to leave. I, 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 you know, I just, I wanted that to be with me forever. And so I, I, I realized at that moment, um, it, it's kind of when it all came about from what I've been hearing, uh, you know, the, the priest say and, and uh, the experiences I'd, I'd had. And, and uh, um, I realized there was nowhere else in this world that uh, I could go to feel that kind of peace uh, than from the presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Um, and I, I realized his body, blood, soul, and divinity, you know, was there. And there was no other church on the face of the earth either that I, that I recognized either that believed in this Holy Sacrament the way the Roman Catholic Church does. So, um, so I, I knew at that point that, I, I, that I, I needed to become Catholic. There was no question. And so, so what, what's, what's interesting is I drove home and I drove home in silence, which I normally had the radio blasting or something like that. I drove home in silence and I reflected on what had taken place throughout the day. And when I walked through the door of my house, Gail uh, was there and she said, well, how did the Catholic Men's Conference go? You know, did you have fun and everything? And I looked at her and my response was, I think I'm going to become Catholic. <laughs> and so, and, and her reply was, uh, you're supposed to just attend the conference. You're not supposed to become Catholic. So what's going on, you know? So, so I had to explain to her, you know, my story of, of what took place and, and this amazing peace that uh, came over me. And so uh, that I knew I couldn't get anywhere else. And so for me, there was no turning back. Um, I remember shortly after, I, I believe it was maybe the next day or the next week. I can't remember which. We went to Jordan Valley to Mass, and I couldn't wait to tell Father Clemens about my experience. And, and I told him, I, I, said, I said, I want to become Catholic. I said, when can I start classes? And I should have probably thought more about my wife's conversion before I said that, because Gail was kind of on a parallel uh, you know, journey, just like I was. It took her a lot longer to convert, of course, than it did me, because she didn't have the same experience as I did. Sure. But I, I, I do have to say that for her, it was also the Eucharist that, that, uh, that really sealed the deal for her because uh, we were at Mass one day. We saw one of the elderly uh, ladies there, uh, and she was the last person to take the chalice. And she took the chalice and just tried to get that one little tiny drop and just shook it and, and hit it and did everything she could and finally got that one little tiny drop that she needed to satisfy her soul. And my wife looked at that and said, that's one of the most beautiful things she'd ever seen. And she knew at that moment that this was real. And that's when she was all in to, to take RCIA. So, you know, uh, we went through RCIA. Father Clemens took us through it, did a great job. Um, you know, uh, we, had a, we had a great, uh, uh, great small group. There was another couple with us. One was already Catholic. The other was not. Um, we got to tell, share our stories. Uh, sometimes they, they would come from Gentura, Oregon, which was quite a ways away, about three hours away from here. Uh, they would drive in. We'd have dinner together. We'd invite Father Clemens to come with us. We'd all, five of us, we'd all get together. We became great friends. And, and uh, it, you know, I, it, before that happened, I guess I should, re, I should go back to uh, Christian Welp and my wife were becoming friends because my wife had served in the Idaho legislature for six years. She was a state representative. And uh, she recognized that the Catholic Church here in Idaho wasn't really well organized when it came to going down and providing testimony in front of the legislature on social issues. And so she was trying to help uh, the bishop and, and the office uh, kind of help uh, strategize some things to, to get that going. And so she got to know Christian well through that. Well, Christian uh, had heard about kind of my conversion because Gail had told him about it through the men's conference. And he uh, met with her for a little bit, and then he gives her the book, Rome Sweet Home, to take home. Um, so it's interesting because we had a vacation plan in Maui for uh, the end of April that year. It was 2016. And she brings this book with her, and we're on vacation for about 10 days. And she keeps reading things in the book and keeps asking me to Google stuff on my phone or, you know, on the computer or on the iPad. And, you know, I was a little irritated, I'll be honest at first, because I was like, we're supposed to be on vacation, you know, we're not supposed to be any, anyway, but, you know, but she kept asking all these questions and questions like, you know, did you know Martin Luther was actually the one that took the books out of the Bible? It wasn't the other way around. And I'm like, no, I didn't know that, you know. So we Google it and yep, sure enough, it'd pull up on there. Yeah, you know, the original books of the Bible were these and it had, you know, Maccabees and, and the Book of Wisdom and all of these other books that had been taken out through the Reformation. So um, anyway, that really helped build her uh, case for her faith to um, and, and to want to enter into our, to RCIA. So 
we uh, started RCIA uh, in July of 2016. Yeah. Um, the very first class, Father Clemens asked, he said, have either one of you been married? And I said, yes, I actually had been. And I, I'd been married and divorced before. Sure. Um, and uh, he's like, well, that's going to be a problem because uh, you're going to have to go through an annulment process. And I'm like, okay. I said, I, I can do that, you know. So it, t- it, it took several months to get that done. Um, uh, th- there were some complications with some things, uh, not, not from the diocese side, but from, from my side. And, and I had a friend actually who, <laughs> who during that time, he, he actually forgot to send his paperwork in and waited three months to, to get it in. So that, that kind of prolonged things too. But um, the reason why I even bring that up is because if anybody out there, uh, if, if, if you're being prevented from joining the Catholic Church because of the annulment process, don't hesitate to go through it because it is one of the most healing things uh, that I've ever been through. And the way the diocese handled everything um, was amazing. And so it, it, it brought a lot of healing uh, for me, uh, for my wife, and, and, uh, and really strengthened our marriage too. It really did. And so it, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, when that finally uh, was approved, uh, we got to uh, enter into the church. It was actually May 20th of 2017. And uh, I remember um, just as you know, we didn't want really anybody there because we wanted just a kind of a small group. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was nice because a lot of folks got the word out to other people. And all of a sudden we walked into the church and there's all these people there. It's like, wow. <laughs> so, and it happened up in Jordan Valley and Father Clemens, uh, uh, was able to get us confirmed and and into the church. And so uh, what a blessing to be part of God's Holy church uh, and and to, you know, to to be able to tell, to be able to tell the story is just, you know, I, 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 I've gone through this in my mind since you contacted me uh, quite a bit and, you know, kind of going back through the history of things, it's brought me to tears sometimes just because it's made me recognize how much God loves me, even though I don't deserve it, you know, and, uh, how much he really wants me to be part of this church. So, yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, you were able to, I think we got bits and pieces that night when we were talking. You know, it's kind of like the five minute version when we were talking. Yeah. So it's good to yeah. see all the, all the many chapters in that story. Do you know, as it relates to the Eucharist, this fascinates me. The Lutherans believe like you said, body, blood. And I, if I'm not mistaken, that's consubstantiation. Yes, it is. Right. And then the Reformed Church, I, I guess I don't know where they stand, but what I've noticed uh, progressively as you got get further and further from the Reformation, the Eucharist becomes, it morphs into a symbol more and more and more. And then once it's a symbol, it morphs into let's receive infrequently or uh, you know every two weeks every four weeks every six weeks you know let's do it twice a year so i don't know if you can speak to that but it's just fascinating as you go back in time all of a sudden bam transubstantiation no deviation aside from there might have been some heresies along the way if i'm not mistaken but that part fascinates me that you just see the 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 sacrament dissolves is really what i'm trying to say and i've seen the same in other sacraments as you get further and further from the catholic church it's almost like it necessitates this less you have to put less emphasis on it because as you put more emphasis you're driven back towards the catholic church so right yeah, it, it, it's exactly as you say. Uh, th- that's right. And, and I've heard, um, I've heard uh, people who are, belong to other denominations, even uh, non-Catholic denominations, flat out tell me that they believe it's a symbol, uh, that, that it, it, it's a symbol. They, they, they said, no, we don't. That person told me, no, we don't believe it's the actual body and blood. No, we do not believe that um, like we do in the Catholic Church. And so it's much different than that. And yes, I would have to say, growing up in the Lutheran Church, um, we had communion. I remember, I think it was once a month, oh. uh, at least at least in the church I grew up in. And then later, uh, when we were part of the church that flared up, um, we were doing it twice a month. So it, it wasn't even every Sunday, like like it should have been, but but it wasn't. And so, um, yes, and, and I have to say that's correct. You know, and, and once you put transubstantiation into the equation. It, it needs to be every day, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> or it should be. Okay. It should I mean, be if a person can, so, yeah, it should be. Should be. Here, yeah. Here. Right. right. And you know, that's a big part of my own journey is going back to the early church and reading what they were saying about the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And I wouldn't say that was certainly not the only thing that hit me, but that was a very powerful element where you can see someone reasoning. If that's true, that one thing is true. What follows from that truth? You know, you can't pick and choose. No, I'm going to go to a church that believes in transubstantiation, but certainly doesn't believe in purgatory. Not going to, not going to happen. Well, the Eastern Orthodox Church would, would argue with me. Maybe that wasn't the best example, but you see my point. You, you automatically leapfrog over the Reformation, and then you can get into these debates about the East-West schism, but other than that, you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I sure do. Yeah. No. I think your audio, your audio went low. Let's see here. Oh, did it? Okay. Yep. Is that better? No, it's no, still. The, re the refrigerator kicked on, so that could have maybe something happened to it. I don't okay. Know. Um, anyway. Better there? No, it's still low. Oh. Well, let's see here. Um, any better there? A little bit better. Um, no, it's still low. We can continue like this. Okay. And then we'll see if I can. I guess I don't know what happened. <laughs> I can edit to see if I can increase your your volume after the fact. Anyway, okay. um, what else was I going to ask you about? Oh, so from 2017, since you came into the church to the current period, what has life been like? What, how is family? How, you know, how, how are friendships, yeah. community, all that? How's that going? Yeah, so, uh, so it, it started... Uh, it started in 2016 after the men's conference. Um, it, it started making me think, uh, you know, I need to kind of change some of the ways that, that I that I think about things and do things. Um, growing, growing up, I've, I kind of had a problem with alcohol uh, through high school. Uh, when I was in the Navy, definitely uh, out of the Navy, not so much, but but it, but it was a problem at times. And so after, uh, in 2017, uh, on, on March 9th of 2017, I just, I quit drinking alcohol altogether, period. Just cold turkey, quit, haven't had a drink since. Uh, I'm not saying I was an alcoholic, but I was probably borderline at times. Sure. But, uh, but it was really my conversion that had a lot to do with it. And, and a little bit of health type issues too with pancreatic stuff or the alcohol triggered it. But, but that was secondary compared to my conversion. Um, Father Clemens uh, invited us to a retreat at his mom's place in Burns uh, that March as well. Uh, it was right, right before Easter. Uh, it, it was actually that Monday of Holy Week. And uh, we had met uh, Father Dominic uh, uh, from Verbum Spey, which is the order that's here in Idaho. Yep. Uh, we met him, met him before because Father Clemens knew him really well, and he's Father Clemens' spiritual father. And so um, so he would enter, uh, oftentimes bring him over to Jordan Valley and we get to know Father Dominic a little. Well, Father Dominic was the guest speaker up uh, in Burns at the retreat we were at. And we had the, the tremendous opportunity to take him back uh, to our house and to take him to the airport the following day. So he spent the night with us, um, even though at that time we weren't Catholic, but I was on my way and my wife was maybe a little bit on her way at that time. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting was I, I was driving back to our house uh, to Wilder, and Father Dominic's in the front seat, my wife's in the back seat, and they start talking about the need for an order in the United States, because my, my wife just flat out asked him, well, do you have, uh, you, do you have the need for an order to be established in the United States? He goes, actually, we would like that. He goes, because we have it in other countries like Mexico and, and, uh, and, and other places, uh, New Zealand and other places, and, and we would very much like that. She said, well, would you ever consider Idaho? And uh, he said, you know, I, I think we might. He said, I have to talk to my superior about it, but I think we probably could. So that conversation led to uh, Gail asking Christian to ask Bishop if he would meet with the superior of Verbum Spey order to come to Idaho. And within a year's time, Verbum Spey came to Idaho. <laughs> and and now, they're, now they're established. Yeah, j j just so that, you know, anyway, in, in Boise, 
so so that happened <laughs> which which was it was really unreal uh, how that happened <laughs> amazing how the holy spirit works um in the meantime my parents did not like at all the fact that i converted uh they, they thought they'd failed um they didn't understand the catholic faith uh they, they'd heard so many negative things about it just like i had growing up sure. you know they hear that we, we all hear things like well they're not christians and they worship mary and all these other kinds of kinds of things that just aren't true um, and so it, it took it took a while for them to kind of come around. They finally have come around over time. Um, I've really had to witness to them though, uh, it, it just 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 through my actions more than anything. And uh, you know, I, I think it's really kind of even made them question, you know, maybe what they believe a little bit, because they've asked me a lot of questions about the Catholic faith that that they didn't probably think that I knew. Uh, and and then I, I think it's answered a lot of their questions, and it's it, it's really intrigued, especially my mother, who's been through cancer this last year, and uh, we we've had a lot of time together in Salt Lake uh, before her cancer treatments, uh, to kind of have that time together to talk about about things, and so it's been really helpful. And so so to answer your question, I guess it's been really positive. It's uh it's had some drawbacks, but it's been really positive, you know, and and we've lost some friends. Uh, because because they, they don't understand why we would convert, um, and we've kept a lot of friends too. But uh, I don't know. I've always thought, you know, if people don't want to be your friend after something like that, then maybe they weren't your friend to begin with. I don't know. But yeah, just, it, it, it is an interesting. That, so. uh, it's an interesting thing when there's so much division about people yeah, I mean, you know, making these choices. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and in a society today where you, it seems like you're forbidden to debate religion or politics, uh, you know, I, I believe in having a real solid discussion with somebody, uh, you know, to, to vet both sides of it properly and then, then may the best person win, I guess. That's what we do in politics at the yeah. legislature. So, yeah. yeah, that's actually um, what I hope will come from these testimonies and just, I don't know, just in greater dialogue, I hope that people can discuss the differences and, and do it with respect and try really hard to understand the other side's position without coming in with a ton of assumptions. Or if you have an assumption, say, like, admit it. I think this is what yeah. you believe. And yeah. then the person can clarify. <laughs> right. Uh, because I'm not about, you know, let's sow more division. That's not what, the, what testimonies are trying to do. I'm actually trying to get some of these misconceptions um, cleared up basically so yeah, yeah yeah that's a great thing it really is because there is a lot as you know a lot of misconception out there for sure yeah and i i i think you know i i just remember growing up hearing hearing things you know uh from church leaders even about the catholic church you know about them not being christians and all this other stuff and it's it's completely false it really is and so yeah. especially well, knowing what i know now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, but no, I mean, you know, uh, you know, in the Lutheran church, I mean, you know, there were times I go through a period of time where I wouldn't attend church very often. You know, there were 52 weeks out of the year. It was embarrassing. I was on the board of elders one year. I think it was my second year. And I think I went to church 28 times that year. Yeah, because they, they would record you, you know, going to church or not going to church on Sunday. And uh, I think I had 28 checks out of 52. That's pretty pathetic, really. Uh, but since being Catholic, um, I think I've uh, maybe missed one or two masses on Sunday just because, well, uh, because of hunting trips, <laughs> uh, you know, anyway, but uh, yeah, and so, but, but no, it, it, it's a priority, it, it, whereas it was really not a priority that much before, it is a priority now. And, and it's not because it's an obligation to go, it, it's because we want to go, we want to worship God. We want to thank him for what he's done for us, for creating us, for loving us, uh, for giving us, you know, his Holy Spirit, for giving us Jesus to die for us. I mean, you know, and all the sacraments. And, and that was another thing was I, I couldn't get over how much the church had to offer. Not only did it have, you know, everywhere I would go, I, I would hear a holy priest talk about just some amazing things. And, and it would just deepen my faith. But we'd have all these sacraments, you know, the sacrament of Holy Communion, the sacrament of you know, baptism, which I thought about before, but really hadn't thought too much about until we started diving into it a little more. Confession, that was a huge one. I remember my first confession was nine pages long because I, I, I had to type it out on a computer. At that, time, I, at, that, at that time, I was 43 years old, going on 44, had a lot of baggage. 
uh, never confessed anything to any priest or anything like that before. So it was all stored up in here. I, I had to let it go. So I just remember it took me two weeks and lots of prayer and time with the Holy Spirit to ask, you know, please guide me and direct me on what I need to do. And I typed that people laugh about this. It, it is kind of funny, but nine pages of single space notes uh, wow. is what I confessed. But but it's it's all gone and, for, and forgiven now. So, you know, um, well, what a huge sacrament we have there just in wow. confession. I That's mean, huge. it's just... It is. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, how, you know, it, and it makes sense, you know, how, how Jesus tells us that, you know, uh, one person who uh, repents of their sin, there'll, there'll be more joy in heaven than 99 who don't need repentance. And so, you know, it, 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 it God wipes the slate clean and, and then you start all over again. It's just amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll add about that is I obviously notice this in my own life until you open your mouth you know, people can say that all day. Oh, I confess to the Lord. I repent. Yeah, we do that on, on a daily basis. You know, we, re, we repent when we, we sin. But there's that humility that God calls us to, to actually open our mouth to another human. And in that moment, if you've never confessed and you sit down, yeah, it can be scary. Yeah, it can be incredibly intimidating. But that's when you know. That's right. when you know. It is so legitimate it causes such humility and for you to finally open your mouth. And like you said, it's just this heart, all this stuff, like you said, baggage. I, I would say the exact same thing about me. All the baggage just comes forward and, and it's, it's so cleansing is really what it is. So it is, it is. Yeah. I, I remember my first confession. I, I, I broke into tears halfway through it and, and, and it was, it was and father just said, don't worry about it. You're just, you're just being cleansed right now. He said, this is, this is natural. He said, this is great, you know? And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what a great priest uh, to, to have that confession with too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Rod, yeah, so there's, yeah. So sorry. I, I did. There's just been some amazing things that have transpired since 2017. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate that. It's um, come full circle for sure. And I, you know, your story is like so many others in that, until you, like you were just saying, preparing for this, until you actually go back, can you see what God was doing? And even then, like when we, when my wife and I go back in time, even then, you're like, oh, I didn't see that. There's yeah. still all kinds of things that were happening that we have no idea about. Right. It's, it's beyond my comprehension, but it's so crucial to be able to, yeah, just go back and really with hindsight, think about all those little blessings, even when there was a struggle all those blessings that God was kind of laying out there for us. So. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing to me uh, the lengths that God goes to, to save us to yeah. really, and, and to show us his salvation, to show us the truth. And uh, he certainly blessed us and our family. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll let you guys know that are watching Roger, believe it or not. So he and I are going to be giving our testimonies at the men's conference. So this is exactly what five years after you attended the first conference, your life was changed. One of the speakers was, was father Larry Richards, who will be a speaker this year in about two weeks here. I just find that fascinating. Another Holy spirit right there, Holy spirit movement. So, um, honestly with that, you know, thank you so much for your time and your awesome testimony and, Everyone that watched, uh, I hope that this blesses you. Until next time, take care and God bless. Bye.